Exeter, hey, how are Jen, you? Hey, Jen, how are you? Welcome to the garden. Thank really nice you. to see you. A beautiful day. It's absolutely lovely. You were the first woman to be the UK ambassador to the United States, which is pretty significant for all the little girls out there. I have one. Did you always wanted to be an ambassador when you were when you were younger? It was the first thing I wanted to be. I then toyed with being a fighter pilot uh, and an accountant, sadly, and also a <laughs> nuclear physicist. An accountant but feels like back. it's out of the realm there. Of, yeah, it is other... a bit, but it's good steady money, basically, <laughs> and a qualification. And I was a student. No, um, interestingly, it was an American diplomat who got me started. When I was um, a young kid, I was reading at the kitchen table a callous supplement, and it had the most fantastic shots of the American consul in Nice, and she was being piped on board an aircraft carrier, and it was just the most fantastic picture, and I thought, that's the job for me. What did your kids think of your role as a diplomat over the years? Um, I think they're quite proud of it. Um, I remember when working on Bosnia uh, in the early and uh, mid-90s, and my son had to write an essay uh, at his school about mothers, about your own mother. Uh, and he began with, my mummy has a job, her job is to help Bosnia. And I thought that put it so well. Yes. And I always felt that as long as I was doing something that they would understand was worthwhile, uh, then it was fine. There are very few high-level women at the table in places like the Middle East, even Asia, even parts of uh, South America. Are there times when that's been uh, an advantage to be one of the only women at the table? I would definitely say that it's, for me personally, it has been as much of an advantage as it has been a detriment. Uh, because people notice you. They may notice you for the wrong reasons, uh, but they notice you. And it's incumbent on you to make them notice you for the right reasons. Have there, there been more women at the table in some of these diplomatic conversations when you were at the UN or when you've been uh, in some of these rooms around the world? Oh, definitely. So when I first went to the UN in the um, mid 2000s, 2006, I think there were three women ambassadors who'd ever sat at the Security Council table. When I went to Geneva 10 years later, there were 45 women ambassadors out of about 180. And then when I went back to the UN uh, in 2018, I think we were up to 50. Uh, so it's, it's not going fast enough, mm -hmm. but it is moving. And in the foreign office, in our foreign service, 50% uh, of the top jobs are held by women. It's amazing. So one of the areas you've spent a lot of time is on issues like Ukraine, mm -hmm. even long before Russia's recent That's invasion. Right. And you've spent a lot of time with Russian diplomats. So tell me a little bit about what you've learned about what makes them tick over the years. Uh, interestingly, I have worked with Russian diplomats as long as I've worked with Americans. I've been negotiating with the Russians for a large part mm -hmm. uh, of my career. They are very good negotiators. Why so? What, what is their style? Well, their style is usually in yet, to be absolutely honest. But the, the aim, I think, is to find something that you can work on with them and try and expose uh, what their real problem is. And, and if, you, if they felt you were sincere in understanding their real concerns, as opposed to their stated concerns, mm -hmm. uh, then you could get something done. What's happened in Ukraine has really moved things to a whole new level, where the old uh, ways of doing business and diplomacy with them, uh, fundamentally, they've thrown them out of the window. Do you still think there's a pathway to work with them on any issues we're trying to solve globally? I, I'm an inveterate optimist, uh, so I don't want to say there never will be. Uh, but I think at the moment uh, it's just too difficult. There's an almost gangster-like quality in some of the things that Russia is doing. Um, I saw that at the UN when they had poisoned someone uh, on the streets of Salisbury, uh, which is an English city. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is not state behavior. So you also spent time as the ambassador uh, to Afghanistan. You did tend to wear heels there, I read. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about that. I, I am a, a, a real girl. I, I like boys' books when I was a kid. I draw airplanes. I love being around military staff. But fundamentally, I like shoes and dresses. And being in Afghanistan, your identity gets suppressed by all the things you have to wear uh, socially, by the fact that you're walking on incredibly rough terrain. So nothing is normal 
And so I would cling to certain things to try and pretend I was still in SW1 in London where the Foreign Office is and heels were part of that. And my close protection team said, oh, man, we didn't know it was possible to walk this slowly. Uh, well, <laughs> it was. You said, hang with me. Exactly. One of the biggest impacts, of course, of mm. the withdrawal is on women and girls in Afghanistan. What should people understand about the impact on them and how women and girls are now living at this moment in time in Afghanistan? So if you think of before the Taliban uh, took over um, two years ago, you had 20 years of peace uh, in Afghanistan. So you had almost two generations come through schooling of one sort uh, or another. And we got the figures up to over 10 million uh, children in school, and that included girls. We have now to all get together and try and find a way to persuade the Taliban to let women continue working in the NGOs and the UN and to get the girls back to school and to get humanitarian assistance to those who need it. And to do that, I think we have to work very closely with our friends in the Middle East uh, who still have ties to the Taliban and can hopefully uh, help persuade them. So um, it's, it's not a, an optimistic scenario at all, even for someone like me who's an optimist. Uh, but I think we've just got to double down and try. I know we were going to go look around a little bit, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, should we do that? Yes, let's Great. do that. I didn't even know this existed here. This is very cool. It's fantastic. This is our wonderful orchid collection looked after by our fantastic gardener, John Sonnier. I just think they're so beautiful, beautiful and they come in so many different, lovely, bright colors. There's always something voluptuous uh, about orchids. Yeah, and we have is. some very good uh, specimens of that. Over there, but sadly not in bloom. Not uh, yet. Not yet. We have um, an orchid named after the queen for her jubilee, which is bright pink. And then we have one for me, which is white and purple and yellow. I was very honored to have an orchid named after me. It's one of the nicest things anyone's ever done for me. Now, I know that there's classical music typically playing in here because orchids like classical music. That's is exactly that really right. a thing? Yes, I actually think the orchids are quite prima donnas. Yeah, they're you know, dramatic. They, they know what they like. In order to then, grow and um, be beautiful, they need classical exactly. music. They need they classical need music, they certain need temperature, spray, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I know we're gonna have some tea made actually the proper way, I understand. That's exactly right. So we'll take let's, that very let's seriously. Let's go head out and do that. After you. Oh, thank you. You made a bit of a name for yourself telling people, instructing people, I guess I should say, how to make a proper cup of tea. I think maybe some Americans are doing it the wrong way. So what should we know? <laughs> so rather than me tell you, what we'd like to do is serve you with a proper cup of English oh, lovely. tea and scones okay. served by the, the staff at, at the residence. Another big event uh, in the UK is the upcoming coronation of yes. King Charles. Um, Thank you. And what people may forget is there hasn't been a coronation like this in decades because That's right. Queen Elizabeth 70 served. years. So can you explain a little bit about the significance of a coronation to a US Certainly. audience? Certainly. Uh, do have a, a Thank scone. you. These I are will. Also part of the afternoon wow, tea those ritual. Look absolutely fantastic. Um, so the coronation is, is literally the crowning of the monarch. But there's a huge amount of tradition that goes with the coronation. There's the very important holy oil. Uh, in days gone by, people believed that when a king was crowned or a queen was crowned, uh, the divine spirit came onto them from God. Uh, the king was deemed to be God's representative uh, in that particular country, God's representative uh, on earth. And the holy oil was to symbolize the mysticism, if you like, that, that comes with that. There still is the holy oil, uh, even though the way people view the monarchy has, has moved on. Now, you have served as a diplomat for the United Kingdom for uh, many decades with Queen Elizabeth in that role. What kind of impact did she have on you um, as you were representing your country? Oh, I think you're just incredibly proud. Whenever I looked at the Queen, I didn't just see the Queen as a person. You kind of see the whole of history and um, the whole of the United Kingdom held in what was quite a tiny uh, figure. She also had a fantastic sense of humour and she was very knowledgeable about American affairs. I had the honour to talk to her on the telephone 
shortly after I became ambassador here, mm -hmm. and she was right up to date uh, on on the. She election. was paying attention. She was paying attention. She asked very good questions. She really, she was really, really sharp. King Charles, who's about to take uh, be coronated very soon, um, how do you think he will be different from her? I think in some things will be very similar. The the dedication, the love of public service, the commitment the wanting to represent everybody. He also has an incredibly good uh, sense of humour. But at the same time, uh, he definitely wants to be uh, modern. He definitely wants to make it a monarchy uh, that's for the future. What do you think the American public, you've been ambassador for a couple of years, doesn't understand about the British monarchy? It feels like a big mystery um, here sometimes. What, what should they know? Um, I think the mystery is part of it, to, to be absolutely honest. Mm -hmm. You know, and... Some people in Britain would feel exactly the, the sure. same way. It's, <laughs> it's the majesty, the, the splendour used in its literal sense, the pageantry. Every single piece of it seems to have the weight of history uh, in it. Uh, I think Americans know a lot about the royal family. They pay close attention. I think they pay close attention in a funny sort of way. Uh, the Queen and the royal family touch more people than we might think. Uh, absolutely. My son is the exact same age as Prince Louis, the same Amazing. day, same is year. He is naughty. That's, he, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if Prince Louis is naughty. My son is. So there you go. Ambassador Pierce, thank you so much for spending time with me and for sharing so much of your background, your history, your knowledge, and of course, giving us a little better understanding of the coronation that everybody will be watching here. Well, it's been absolutely lovely having you, Jen, and please come back. We'll give you a proper afternoon tea with cucumber sandwiches. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. The scones look amazing, though. Yes, well, thank take you. some home for your children. <laughs> thank you so much. Nice thank to you. see you. Thank Thanks you. for you having too. me.